Well, hey, I'm happy to be here. And Clark, you're, you're very nice to say I'm a world-renowned uh, rodent person. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Lance Ellis, and I'm the Fremont County Extension Educator. That's up in St. Anthony, Ashton, and Island Park is my county. And uh, for sake of time, we're going to be kind of rolling through these pretty quickly. But I want to just uh, give you a little preface. Down here at the bottom, there's Glenn Shoemaker and Danielle Gunn. And Danielle Gunn, me, and Glenn, and then also um, Sherm Takatori and Rhonda Hernick, we are currently finishing up a publication on controlling voles and gophers in ag lands. And that publication, you know, we, it should have been out already, but it's tied up in the publishers. And it'll be a publication for Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. So when that does come out, hit your county extension offices up for um, a possible way to get a copy of that. It's going to be a great um, present, uh, publication. Um, so look them up for that. So understanding your populations and what they're going to do to you and do to your crops, um, you have to understand that you know, nature will control itself in a lot of ways, but uh, you may have to step in there and, uh, and do something to, so you still get a crop. Um, so understanding their animals' ecology and the, their behavior, and then finding out all of the good information on how to have the right technique to employ that right at the right time. It's very important. So as they say, integrated pest management, um, it's not just a chemical control. There are several other things you can do to help decrease your pest populations in your fields. So talking about our thresholds of when you actually need to start doing something rather than just saying, okay, you know, this is, is not a problem. Um, there is no real set threshold. You know, it's not saying, okay, I have five uh, voles in one acre of land, you know, that's the threshold. No, that, that is not a set threshold um, by any means. Um, and really there aren't any. So the best way to, to watch this is that you as the producer, when you start seeing it affect your crop, you determine your threshold. Okay? Because it costs money. It costs money to run the tractor across there to create a barrier. It costs money to buy the product and to apply it. And if, you know, if it's not going to cost you, I mean, if it's not going to uh, um, make economic sense to go and spend all that money in comparison to what you're you know, possibly going to lose from those voles, then obviously you need to make that decision of whether or not. Um, now, high population in southeast Idaho and voles and gophers know no borders. They don't know the difference between Utah and Idaho. So I could say um, that this is also a problem down here. So they cause significant damage to small grains, alfalfa, row crops, and rangeland. Um, yield reductions up to 30% or more. Um, in Idaho, they're a non-game mammal. So like uh, Clark had mentioned, um, the Utah State man in the back, he can uh, correct any of uh, the discrepancies that I may share today. So anyway, talking about this, how they damage your crops. They love alfalfa roots and the shoots at the very bottom. That is like going to Chukarama. It's a great buffet. And we provide that by having a great stand of alfalfa in our fields. So understand what they are. If you look right down in here, if you can see this, what makes a vole? What's the signifying uh, attributes they have is this short little tail right here. So if you see them, and you, you, you know, you're seeing mice out there. The way that you understand that you have a vole infestation is look for this short tail. They're only about four to five inches long, small rounded ears, coarse fur is blackish brown to grayish brown in color. Okay? So this is how you identify them and know you have a, a vole population going on. If you look right here at this picture, here's some examples of vole damage. Now he's done a pretty good job of planting and you can see where, you know, he's had a really good stand right there. And then look at this same planting furrow right next to it that's been almost completely eliminated by vole damage. Okay? And they burrow down into the soil just a little bit, right underneath the level of the soil. Go right for the roots. It's a great food source for them. So as it says, short burrows and underground nests. Now the peak breeding season period is spring with a second smaller breeding period in the fall. Litters average about four. The numbers fluctuate from year to year, and we'll talk, to, talk about that a little bit more uh, as far as how quickly they can overwhelm your crop. Um, and they're cyclic. 
just so you, we all understand. So understanding what makes it so they have a high population or a low population. If you have vegetation greater than six inches tall, now why this matters, six inches tall, it gives them a habitat that they are not going to be pre, uh, predated, not going to be eaten by hawks, cats, your dog, something like that, okay? It's open to the public. It's, it's open to, uh, to all the predators out there. So if they have it six inches great or tall or taller than six inches, gives them protection from predators. Now, ideal weather. What's ideal weather for voles? A mild winter with snow cover, okay? If we have a harsh freeze, for example, um, they're going to be underneath that snow and they're pretty well insulated. Now, let's take a few years back. We stepped back in about 2006 and we had up there in Idaho, we had a warm spring melt and um, basically it was a matter of three days. I mean, everything was flooding. There was flooding across ag lands all over the place. And what it did was it flooded out all of their little burrows on to, that are under the snow, filled them full of water, and then we had a real good hard freeze. And that's the only time I will say a real good hard freeze because it froze them out. froze all that water um, down inside of their burrows. They had no more habitat. And, I mean, we did not have a vole population. Ideal weather. If we don't have those conditions, we have snow cover and there's forage underneath there, yeah, you're, you're creating a, a kind of a perfect storm for a high population of voles the following. Another thing is high protein food sources. So this is, this is how when I said they're cyclic about their populations, a minor peak population happens every four to six years, an epidemic population every 10 to 12 years. And that's really what we've been seeing for the last couple years. Um, once again, in most people's opinions and in a lot of areas, they've seen a real rise in the damage caused by voles. So <laughs> they only last about a year, supposedly. We're still seeing the damage. I mean, there just hasn't been um, the right conditions to get rid of them, to knock them down. So we still have a high population. So this is, this is a, a range. So you've got about 2 to 100 plus voles per acre. If you've got 2 voles per acre, um, that's probably not a big deal to put it lightly. If you got 100, well, you got vole central. And if you got more than that, you got quite a lot of voles because they're going to do a lot of damage. So talking about them, under favorable conditions, they increase rapidly. Like I said, they're cyclic. They fluctuate. Last couple of years have been bad. Um, mild winters. Two wet springs produce a lot of forage. And this one right here is your CRP. If you border rangeland right next to your alfalfa property, or your yard, for example, you have a perfect place for them to live over winter. Nobody's bothering them. They got habitat, and then they come right on in. So this, if you have this uh, you know, CRP or a piece of property that's not being used for anything, not even being grazed or anything like that, then that's a great habitat for voles to come into your property. And then other grazing issues um, can play into that. So here's a few examples. I like these because... Uh, People talk about their gardens a lot, and they call up and they ask questions. Well, you know, I got voles in my garden, and I got a few pictures here that, that kind of uh, demonstrate that. Um, but their range isn't a whole lot, but remember that their populations can expand rapidly. So they may only range into your property just a little bit, but then they multiply, and then they spread. They multiply, and then they spread. And you can get these right into the middle of your alfalfa field, um, just because of the way their populations grow. So it's always on roots and stems, tree trunks. That's another thing. I don't know how many of you here um, have orchards, but uh, tree trunks are another great food. Understanding during the wintertime, they remain hidden under the snow or vegetation. They don't normally invade your structure or your home. It's good to know. That's not where they go to. They like to be out in the fields. And here's another thing. They can transmit diseases to laramia, so, meadow vulcan, vole control, remove or reduce the vegetative cover. So you initiate a program of habitat modification or population reduction before their numbers explode. If you start seeing signs, then that's when you need to do something about it rather than waiting until it's a real problem. How do you do that? You look for their signs, you mow or burn ditch banks, borrow pits, and fence lines, because that's a great place for them to live. Nobody bothers them there. You plow, disc, rake, burn, and 
obviously you're not going to do that to snow. <laughs> but anything that you can do that obviously isn't going to injure your crop um, to help break down their habitat. So clear weeds and debris from windbreaks. If practical, develop cultivated buffer strips around large acreages. And this one right here, graze or mow your alfalfa and pasture in late fall. Leaving a stand on there into the fall is where they're going to just have great habitat. So once again, you create the perfect environment. Um, if you aren't taking care of your field properly, you're making it a good home for them. So these are the habitat modification methods. Um, like I said, you know, anything that you're doing, for example, we've got a guy who's uh, creating a buffer strip right here, plowing up that edge ground right there to try and keep it down. Um, mower burning his ditch banks. And, you know, a lot of people who do flood irrigation, I mean, you get a, 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 a vole population in there, and they're drilling little holes into the sides of your ditch banks, and you now have a uh, little water that starts coming through, and then a lot of water kind of starts coming through, and you've lost your ditch right there. They're a, uh, a great way to knock your ditches out. So keeping in mind that keeping the habitat, keeping that grass off of there, keeping the food off of there, off the sides of the ditch bank, mowing it down so that they can be eaten by hawks and eaten by cats and, and they're available to uh, the predators, that helps. Now predators don't keep the populations down. If, the, if things are right, the populations are going to explode whether there are predators or not. So uh, that's where we come in. So trapping in a small area, trapping may be effective. The simple wooden mouse trap, if you just got a small population and you don't want to go and get too hog wild with anything, Trapping works. Now here's the key to trapping them. Place your traps at right angles to and flush with the ground in the runways. It's not so much what's on the trap as far as the bait. It's the fact that they're running, gun ho and they hit it, and it traps them. So right here, if you can kind of see this, I know it's a little bit hard, but right here is a runway, and right here is a runway. This one running across right here, he's going to run right smack dab across, across that trigger and pop. He's on. So, as it says, um, place trap at right angles to and flush with the ground. Trap of 50 to 100 traps should be used if you're going to do trapping. Now that gets a little tedious if you uh, want to go out and set out 100 traps. If you've got a small problem, trapping can work. Um, but if you've got a large problem, no, this isn't, it's not effectively going to work. Toxic baits. The most effective for large populations, particularly if habitat manipulation is not practical or possible. Some baits can be broadcasted. Bait stations are effective where non-target poisoning may be an issue. Um, and we all know that, and I'll get it more into this non-target poisoning, I and mean, that's the big kicker about all of this is, let's say you're using something, it has to, you know, you have to be cognizant and aware of what non-target animals may possibly get into that bait. And that can affect your decision right there, whether or not you can use it. I mean, it decides it really for you. I mean, I worked at one ranch, and they had dogs. They didn't want, the, they didn't want to hit anything, you know, didn't want dogs to get a hold of any voles that had a, a poison in them. They also had swans. And the swans, you know, probably weren't going to be interested in eating a dead bull, but the bait looked appealing, so we couldn't have the bait anywhere near them, so we didn't get to use bait. We used about everything else, and I'll talk more about what we did to try and control those voles in that area. This, we'll get more into that. So late fall, early winter, and spring are best times for control. Now, understanding why that is. Late fall, we don't have a lot of great vegetation growing. Early winter, we once again don't have a whole lot going on. And then spring. Now, late winter and early fall, there's not a lot of fresh, good forage out there. So if I were to, like today, we had a great lunch of roast beef. If uh, Clark had said we've ordered y'all saltine crackers and cheese, <laughs> or we got roast beef dinner, we'd all take the roast beef dinner, which we did. Um, same with bulls. If you're offering them a dry pellet or a um, crimped oat or something like that, they're going to choose something that's more succulent and more tasty. Now, that's not really available during late fall, and that's not really available during early spring, now, during early winter. Now, springtime, that's during the breeding season. That's when a lot of reproduction is going on, a lot of babies are being grown, and they're consuming a lot. 
Um, summer, no. This is not, that's not the time you want to try and... When meadow voles are numerous or when damage occurs over large areas, that's when you want to do this. Here's the thing. Take care to ensure the safety of children, pets, and non-target animals. And follow your label instructions exactly. I had one of my friends who, as a little kid, he uh, went over. His dad had a cherry orchard. And uh, he got into what he thought was a candy bar. It was a green candy bar. And he told his dad it didn't taste very good after he'd eaten it. And his dad's first words were, your mother's going to kill me. Not, oh my heavens, you're going to die. <laughs> it was, your mother's going to kill me. Anyway, so he, uh, he said he blacked out at that point. So now talking about zinc phosphide, first off. Zinc phosphide is a restricted use product in California, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. And uh, I'm going to just assume that it is also down here in, in Utah. But... Uh, this, al this allows the bait to be used with the alfalfa crop, something that can only be done if it is allowed on the rodenticide label. Okay? Now, talking about why zinc phosphide, its nature, and why it, uh, it can kind of work um, a little bit better than other baits, and we'll talk about the other ones. Zinc phosphide, the vole comes along, he finds this bait, he eats it, goes into his body. Unlike anticoagulant baits, it as soon as it reacts with the moisture inside of his body, it gasses off. So there's not a residual left in the tissue of that dead vole. Therefore, the chance of a secondary poisoning happening from a cat or a hawk or something flying along and eating that dead vole is greatly reduced. Okay? So that's one of the reasons why zinc phosphide is, is being used um, almost all the time now. The Conversely, that's one of the bad uh, adverse effects of anticoagulant baits is that there is a residual left in those voles for non-target poisonings later on. So Prozap is one brand that, that is marketed under. Once again, if this is not available in the state of Utah, I'm not sharing this recommendation. <laughs> but uh, you can use it on alfalfa, barley, wheat, potatoes, sugar beets, dry beans, and rangeland. Wheat and barley. Do not apply post-harvest or pre-plant. Do not apply within 50 days of harvest. Okay? There is aerial or ground broadcast of this. Okay? There are several endangered species considerations to keep aware of, and I'll talk about those in a second. So here's a few of them. A whooping crane. Now the Utah prairie dog. Um, do not use this product in the range of the Utah prairie dog. Um, there you go. Pygmy rabbit, and do not use this product within one mile of alfalfa fields in the known range of the pygmy rabbit. So there's endangered species out there that, that really dictate how, where this can be used. Here's an example. It's a restricted use pesticide. Um, I don't know exactly how your licensing is as far as it is different from Idaho, but we have to, you have to obviously have a license to be using any restricted use pesticide. Um, whether private or professional applicator, you have to have that. So here's examples. This can be used in alfalfa lawns, golf courses, and other non-crop areas. And uh, just an example right here. This is for the control of ground squirrels, prairie dogs, rats, voles, mice, meadow mice. Here's examples of how hand baiting, locating underground burrows, applying bait to runways. Just examples of this in talking about it. Now, I don't know what Utah, I was on their website actually um, trying to find a page like this to put in here, but this is at a State Department of Ags, and uh, it gives a pretty good example of the active ingredients, pest controlled, and sites to which this product may be applied. So alfalfa use restrictions, just so you understand this, you can use it, but for control of voles um, in alfalfa, all applications must occur shortly after a cutting of the hay and or prior to the new growth attaining a length of two inches. Now what happens is as soon as this um, zinc phosphide has moisture get into it, it gasses off. So if you have applied this and the voles don't eat it and it gets wet, its effective rate, its rate of efficacy goes right down. I mean it's just, it's starting to gas off and react. Okay? So alfalfa forage from treated areas must not be harvested until it reaches maturity. Do not apply this product to alfalfa within 30 days of harvest. Okay, so there are a lot of restrictions on it um, to be used. So right now, this product can be broadcast by air or ground-driven dispensing devices. 
and gives examples right here of what, uh, what can be done. But here's the big kicker right down here at the bottom. Do not apply in piles or permit piles to be formed by equipment. That's on almost, almost all of the labels. You'll see that with this product is that you just can't let piles form up. Place, now, if you're using this zinc phosphide, place the bait and runways or next to burrows where bulls will find it. Broadcast in the area where bulls will fi are found. Best to use bait stations. And I'll give you some examples here of bait stations, what that would look like and what's a good one. Um, always follow your labeled instructions and bulls that feed on the bait but do not buy, but do not die, can become bait shy. I, I would have to check with what you guys are allowed to do. It's funny, Clark, I'm going to bring this up here. Clark just asked a question about broadcasting and if we're going to cover it. Three weeks ago, I was preparing the same presentation and giving it up in Salmon. And literally the day before, I got word that they had changed the rules upon broadcasting um, zinc phosphide. And so for the sake of they're changing it, and I don't know. So I don't know exactly how to answer that right now, specifically because they have changed it within the last three weeks. So once again, you'll have to just check your... Um, don't get it wet. Moisture activates this chemical, rendering it ineffective very quickly. The bowls can be pre-baited with vegetables and peanut butter, but this practice generally is not necessary. Some people say you can pre-bait them. Generally, it's not necessary. Here's one kicker about zinc phosphide. Do not use in the same field more than once in a six-month period. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of restrictions. This is deadly stuff. Um, it's rapid acting. You can find dead bulls within 12 hours of baiting. That's very quick efficacy as far as kill rate. And when practical, dead bulls in the open, such as long roads, dispose of dead bulls by burying them. So like I said before, it does not accumulate in the tissue of the bulls. So the predators or scavengers, the dogs and cats, the hawks that come along, are less likely to be affected by eating the poison roads. However, here's the big kicker. Children, as well as pets, birds, and other animals can be affected by the bait. So store it out of reach. Now, obviously, children getting into the bait, obviously, they're going to be exploring, and so you need to keep your um, bait secured so that no children can get into it. But birds and pets, and birds especially, so let's say you go out there and you're applying this bait. Um, it's sitting out there on the ground. The, the, you know, let's say it's used in alfalfa when it's really down there and short, and, uh, and the birds are able to see this. And... It's a bait. It's food. Birds are going to look at it. They're going to think, hey, I'm going to, I'm going to use that. You have a poisoning issue right there because that hasn't been, you know, hasn't been um, degraded by time or anything like that. It's been broadcast out there and birds can get into it. So you need to be cognizant of the birds and obviously pets that can get into it too. So this is one of the dangers of using it is that birds especially can get into it. So... Use fresh bait. Don't use old bait if it has an off odor or it's moldy. You can pre-bait with a non-toxic bait and get them accustomed to having this food source there. So yes, you're feeding, your, you're feeding the bulls prior to. And then um, you hit them with the stuff that's been treated. And then uh, what happens is they, they consume it. It increases the consumption rate and you have a better kill rate on it on the control rate. So here's an example right here of Prozap zinc phosphide oat bait. About 2% zinc phosphide, other ingredients, 98% inert ingredients. So these are examples. And right here, an endangered species consideration. So you got your whooping crane and uh, yellow-shouldered blackbirds. Um, so examples right there of birds that can get into this. Now moving from zinc phosphide to a, your anticoagulant baits, your first generation anticoagulant baits, as far as I have understood this, and it has been explained to me from you know, years past and from the Idaho State Department of Ag, your first generation ones are like your warfarin, your diapasinone. Um, these are multiple feed. Okay? They're going to eat them several times and die. Uh, you know, blood thinners is what they are, and they'll die. Now, these are used for residential use. Anybody can go and buy these. Uh, and uh, then you'd want to use a bait station, obviously, to keep them from having a non-target poisoning. But then there's second-generation baits, second-generation anticoagulant baits. These are a single feeding um, type of application. They are not allowed to be sold in grocery, drug, hardware, or home improvement stores. 
These are some of the active ingredients right here. And um, products with these active ingredients are restricted to professional farm, ranch, and facility use. And I don't know in the state of Utah if it's a restricted use, but I'm going to assume that, yes, these are probably restricted use products. So I was actually talking to, um, his name was Drew, from the Utah State Department of Ag this morning. And he was ta we were talking about the EPA restrictions and the changes that are going on. And he had said, you know, they're going to have their new... Uh, information out regarding the first and second generation products um, in February and I said well in my presentation and from what I know it's going to be June 4th and it was pretty good because he goes oh okay you know there's that date but you know hopefully we know by then and then basically after existing stocks are sold in accordance with the EPA's rodenticide management decision um, of June 4th 2008 so this is what's happening right now. This is, there's going to be new information set out as far on June 4th, as from what we have been told. It says anticoagulant baits are registered for meadow voles. Um, once again, this is another control treatment option for you. But in the, use in areas adjacent to the alfalfa field or during crop dormancy or where contact with the alfalfa plant will not occur. Okay? Um, they are not allowed to be used in crop fields because these are anticoagulant baits. Your multiple feeding baits are not allowed to be. So your anti, these are a few more examples right here. As it says right here, they cannot be applied on food or feed crops directly. They can be used around f field perimeters. So if you have a problem that um, you know, you, you've got your, your, your fence lines, you can use them around your perimeters. Um, this is another example. It's a restricted use product. They can be used in non-crop areas. Okay? Once again, there's none that are, are registered for in-crop use. So these are slower acting, as it says. They're, these, this is the first generation more specifically. They're slower acting and must be consumed over a period of days to be effective. Whole grain baits are commonly recommended, but pelleted baits are also available. Now, let's say you've got a problem with voles on your ditch bank. Moisture-resistant paraffin block baits are useful around ditches and other areas where high moisture may cause other types of bait to degrade and fall apart. So that's another way to take care of that. Because voles must feed on anticoagulant baits over a period of days, the bait must be available until the population is controlled. Bait placement is very critical. If you're putting it where there's really no entrance, exits, runways, or anything like that, you're not going to get them. That's, put them in their thoroughfare areas where they're going to find them. Okay? So, if it's allowed to broadcast, make sure you spread it evenly. Multiple broadcasts may be necessary. Read your label carefully. Um, these baits, baits are toxic, extremely toxic, some of them, to other animals. So take care and keep non-target animals from eating the bait. And like I said before, no anticoagulants are registered for in-crop use at this time. And uh, for sake of time, we're going to jump forward here. This is a bait station right here. It's a very simple one. It's not very expensive to make. Um, this is a diagram by Sherman Takatori from the Idaho State Department of Ag. Basically, you have PVC pipe, two inch diameter, um, eight inches on both sides. And what you have right here is one tall six to eight inch long stem that comes up at the top. This is a cap. You pop your cap off. You fill this full of... Uh, well, not completely full, but you fill it with um, bait right in here. The vole comes along right through here, and he runs right in here. He's able to pull a little bit of the bait, eat it, run out. He dies. Um, what happens is that you don't have any moisture getting into your bait. And this right here is a, he's got a little, he's calling this a stake, this long black stem right there. You need to anchor these down so that, let's say, a dog comes along and thinks this is a play toy. He doesn't rip it off and shake it all over and spread all the bait everywhere. Okay? So you need to fasten them down so that no non-target animal um, can get into them and, and ruin them. A really cheap and pretty inexpensive uh, bait station is this one. It's a quarter-inch sheet of plywood. And then you have a fill tube on the top of it that you fill up. Now, what happens is you're creating a habitat underneath this piece of plywood right here for voles to go under there, they scurry around, they create their little houses, and they find this nice little buffet of baited poison in there. It can be controlled. Now, 
this is pretty simple. You want to place some heavy brick objects, heavy objects like bricks and different things like that to keep it down so that if a dog gets a, a hold of it, he's not ripping it up and trying to... Depends on how bad of a population you have. If you've got a population that... You know, I'd start, I'd just start and see, you know, start and put one in and, you know, let's say you've got a... It depends on how many you got. If you've got a bad population, then, you know, maybe a few more stations wouldn't hurt. This right here, this is a nice one right there if you ever want to have a, a bull control right there. Kitties with guns. Now talking about our pocket gophers. They're burrowing rodents that get their name from the fur-lined external cheek pouches or pockets and they use for carrying food and nesting materials. So here's some benefits to gophers. Nobody ever thinks about this. <laughs> you got increased soil fertility. You got increased soil aeration. You have increased soil formation and increased water infiltration. Big fat hairy deal. So that's why you bring this along <laughs> and you take care of your problem. Now, um, <laughs> all kidding aside here, talking about our, our pocket gophers, they l basically are made perfectly for destroying, well not destroying, but creating tunnels and destroying your crops in the end. But they are large clawed front paws, fine short fur that doesn't cake when it gets wet, doesn't get caught up with the fr with uh, dirt, and their eyes are small and highly sensitive facial whiskers. I mean, they are mo made for just living under the soil. They remain underground in their burrow system, although you'll sometimes see them feeding at the edge of an open burrow, pushing dirt out of a burrow or moving into a new area. They form mounds. Now, this is your big key right here. If you're going to control them through baiting um, and trapping, is identifying mounds. Okay? Typically, mounds are crescent or horseshoe shaped. So you'll look at them. And what you want to do is be able to, when you're looking at it, I'll show you an example here in a second about um, how to dig into a vole mount, into a gopher mount to place your bait or your trap. But a burrow system can cover 200 to 200 to 2,000 square feet. I mean, they can be huge. They don't have a huge hole. It's two and a half to three um, and a half inches in diameter. Now, the feeding burrows are 6 to 12 inches below ground, and the nest and food storage chamber can be as deep as 6 feet down there. I'll show you a picture here, right here. So, this right here, we're looking at, at this side view, right in here, if you can kind of see this. This is the main burrow system right along there, and then you have these lateral burrows that come up to the surface, right here, off of the sides. And then you're looking at the top view of it, Here's your main burrow that travels right down kind of through the center, the epicenter of all this, and then it has all these lateral burrows off to the side. Okay? So what you want to do as you're getting ready to control them is locate areas of recent gopher activity based on the fresh mounds. Okay? Now if you're not seeing a lot of fresh mounds, go over there and knock over the mound and come back a few days later and see which ones have been knocked I mean, not knocked, but have been pushed back up again and been fluffed back up again. So look for fresh dirt. Fresh mounds that are visible above ground are the plugged openings of all of these lateral little um, openings right there. So you find the main burrow by probing about 8 to 12 inches from the side, plug side of the mound. It is usually located 6 to 12 inches deep. Okay, so 8 to 12 inches from the plug side of the mound. And I'll show you probing for burrows right there. So as it says, when the probe penetrates the gopher's burrow, there will be a sudden drop of about 2 inches. So you'll be probing, probing, and then all of a sudden you'll feel it give a little bit. Um, Here's a big problem here, is you need to find the main burrow, not just a lateral burrow, because some of the lateral tunnels are not revisited, and they're not reused again. Okay? He was investigating something, he went there, he's not going to be used again. And sometimes they'll even plug them up. I mean, if they didn't find, you know, it wasn't, wasn't useful. So, finding your main burrow is very, very important. So here's some bait options for you. There's strychnine. It's harsh on a primary and secondary. There is no above ground use registered in the state of Idaho. Um, you'll have to verify in, you know, within the state of Utah if that's even allowed at all. Anticoagulants, they're slower acting, but they're thorough. And zinc phosphide is fast acting. Gas is off in contact with moisture. Once again, there can be bird toxicity. Trapping, so safe and effective method for controlling pocket gophers is a two-pronged pincher trap such as the Maccabee, Cinch, or Gophinator which the gopher triggers when it pushes against a flat vertical pan. This one right here is a choker box style. I thought I had some pictures. 
I actually had a, a separate presentation, but the pictures weren't coming up on it, so I had to use this one at the last second. And I had pictures of all these traps. Um, so this is your steps to setting your traps and setting them right, is locate the main tunnel with a probe, use a shovel to open the tunnel wide enough to set the traps in pairs facing the opposite directions because you've got a thoroughfare and traffic comes from both directions. Place traps with their openings facing in opposite directions. Um, you'll intercept them, and you, you can actually get a 20 to 60% success depending on the trap. Now understand that in each one of these gopher burrow systems, unless it's breeding season, you've only got maybe one gopher in there. You don't have a whole bunch. You've only got one. If it's breeding season, yeah, you could have a few more. You could have a female in there and a male or a couple females or something like that. Um, but during normal run-of-the-mill, no, there's generally only one in there. So here's some examples right here. This is figure A on this side right here. We dug a hole down. We found the main burrow. And we've attached to a stake and a wire, one trap heading this way, one trap heading that way. And then second right here is a lateral trap. And we've dug it out. We slid a, lateral, a, slid a trap down in laterally into this um, burrow. And once again, you have to secure them. Otherwise... They can go away if, uh, if that gopher isn't caught, depending on the, on the trap. Some of them kill instantly. Some of them just trap them. Here's some, uh, oh, this is I'm making sure that this is in the slide set. This is good. Okay, so we have our cinch, our maccabee, and our black hole. Black hole, as far as efficiency, it's not that great. Your maccabee, which is this one right here, a little bit more, and then your cinch one, by far, I mean, you're almost at you know, a little over 40%, which is pretty good. You're baiting with toxic baits. <clears throat> Always place pocket gopher bait in the main underground tunnel, not the lateral tunnels. After locating the main gopher tunnel with a probe, enlarge the opening by rotating the probe or inserting the larger, a larger rod or stick. And follow label directions. Place the bait carefully in the opening using a spoon or other suitable intimate that you use only for that purpose. Don't spill any on the ground. So here's some examples of what I'm talking about. You clear out that hole, you find down into the main tunnel, and this is a spoon dipping, dishing it out right there. Or you've probed down in, you've made a hole, and once again you're using a spoon to pour it down in there. Or you can use a funnel method where the probe is actually part of the funnel method on this, and you, are, you made a hole, and then you're able to just plunger a little bit of that bait right down into the main tunnel. They're going to come along. They're going to find it. Now, one of the things, probing is more effective than the hand because you're not doing as much destruction to the, to the main burrow. They're more likely to find it when you're not in there um, digging around and, and making a, a, a bigger mess inside of their, their burrow system. Um, so, you know, probing is going to be a little bit more effective. This is an example. This is gopher bait 50, strychnine treated grain bait, only for use in subsoil. And then this is one of the examples that I use from Idaho. State Department of Ag. Strychnine treated grain is the most common type of bait used for pocket gopher control. Generally, it's about 0.5% strychnine. Um, you can use 2% zinc phosphide is also available. These baits are lethal after one feeding. They are done for. So here's another example. This is ZP Ag Oats. Zinc phosphide is right about 2% right there. For control of meadow voles, long-tailed California voles, long-tailed voles, California voles, all these different ones. It says here, all applications must occur shortly after a, yeah, that other one. So after placing the bait in the main tunnel, close the probe hole with sod, rocks, or some other material that excludes light. They're light sensitive. So if you leave an opening, they're going to try and come over there and push it full because they don't want light coming down into their burrows. Okay? So th that's one of their things that they don't want. So don't leave light there. Okay? Several bait placements within a burrow system will increase your success, tamp down or clear existing mounds so you can distinguish. Now talking about a burrow builder applicator, what this looks like. This is an improperly formed burrow, and I'll show you why here in a second, but it shows you it just comes right along, and they're just happily living right there. But this is what the machine looks like right here. This is what it looks like on a cross section. It's coming through here, but I had a picture here. Basically what happens is it's metering out um, the bait, and it's creating an artificial burrow. And it's dropping that bait out in that artificial burrow. Now, here's examples of places that it's, there's Utah right there. 
This is Rose All Pocket Gopher Bait Burrow Builder Formula. You want to use a burrow builder formula for this, obviously. It's, uh, it's approved in the states of Utah, so there you go. When you're doing this, here's your burrows. I mean, they're going to kind of go in a wavy line. It's a pretty good example right here. And here's your lateral holes. All of those little round circles are kind of your lateral holes that come up to the surface. You want to go crossways to them. Don't go with them. Go crossways to them. 20 feet intervals. What's going to happen is that gopher is going to be going along in his main tunnel, and all of a sudden he's going to see this, this opening on both sides that you've created with your burrow builder. And they're curious. So he's going to either go to the left or he's going to go to the right. And he's going to investigate it. And what's he going to find? About six to eight pounds per acre, picking up any spilled bait. It's the entire label for that. The other thing is when soil conditions allow. So if you've got some sandy soil and it's not going to make a good um, burrow or it's going to be really muddy or something like that, then that's not the time to be applying this. Now, I don't know if any of you have used a rodinator before. This is another option in controlling um, gophers. And I've seen it used also on, on voles. I've used it on voles, um, and that's what they, they claim it to do um, also. And what it is is a mixture of, a set of acetylene and ox. And, um, and what it is, I, when I had, when I ran it, that's not me. And the guy looks, yeah, you brace up when you do it. But anyway, it goes like this. Yeah. You take it over, you've got that long gun kind of a, of a thing right here, if you can see this pretty well right here. It's like a long gun that has a big bulb on the end of it. And you go up there and you plug it into the hole. And then you meter out and you count it down, this mixture of how, and how much time you're counting, how much time. And it's pushing out a mixture of this um, combustible gas in there. And I mean, it's pushing it in there. And then you get to the amount of time you're supposed to wait and count down to. And then you turn it off and you ignite it. And you have to have safety equipment because you can really get yourself hurt if you don't. Ear protection and eye protection. And they should have butt protection too for that matter because it throws stuff up as you can see in this. But anyway, I, I used it and I literally had little flaming projectiles of voles smoking. 20 feet in the air. It was a pleasant thing. If I felt stressed, I went out and I played with the rodinator. I didn't play. I worked. I was paid to do that. So anyway, it's a, uh, it's a very, um, it's a fun way to take care of them. A lot of people, you know, find varied success with them. I had a good time. There's also a pressurized exhaust rodent control system. Just to give you an idea, by the way, a, a, you know, you're not seeing a whole lot right here, except for here's the, the uh, I call it the gun portion, but um, there's the cables that come over here. And then you need to have like either a John Deere Gator or... Uh, you could hook, put it in the back of your pickup, but you've got to carry those tanks around. So it's a little cumbersome. Okay? But if you've got a big population, it might, be a pop, it might be a consideration. That'll run you, if I remember right, I think they were running between $23 and $2,700. This one right here, this pressurized exhaust rodent control system, um, that one, basically what it does, it has a little engine, takes the exhaust from the engine, it pressurizes its own exhaust, and then you put a bunch of these probes down in there, and they put that pressurized exhaust down into the um, burrow system, and they die because they are breathing in carbon monoxide. You know, this one right there, that bad boy is about five to six thousand dollars at least. So it's a um, fumigants. I uh, I was talking with once again um, the Utah State Department of Ag um, Drew, and uh, just talking about fumigants and um, that they were, I don't remember exactly how you, oh, he said you had to have the fumigant on your license for down here in the state of Utah. Up there in Idaho, you have to have restricted use on your um, license. But down here, obviously, this is an, another example of a fumigant. So gas cartridges, that's another one, not very effective. So once again, you read your labels, make sure you're, la you're allowed to do this. Now, here's another one. This is a unique... Um, Way, to, way of taking care of it. You take a bucket, drill a hole in the bottom of it, attach a fan, just a little pressurizing air fan. And these are road flares. And you take a highway flare, five gallon bucket, electric fan. You gotta be able to attach that fan to the top of that bucket right there, okay? And a battery for the fan to make it pressurized. 
And then you dig out the spot, make sure that you got an easy access down to that burrow, you light your flares, <laughs> invert the bucket, turn on the fan, and wait until all of the flare is out, okay? Because it's putting all of that smoke right down into there. And then display, dispose of the flares and cover that hole. So in closing, just a few words of caution. Always read and follow your instructions. Don't use the product unless the pest you are attempting to control is on the label and the site also, so voles and alfalfa, as well as the instructions for application and timing and everything else. The pesticide recommendations that I've shared with you today, they do not substitute for anything that's then on the label, the label is law, okay? Especially where we're down here in the state of Utah. Pesticide laws and labels change frequently. Like I said before, they have changed within the last three weeks as far as just several different aspects. So don't use a pesticide unless it's labeled to do so. And store your pesticides in original containers. Keep them out of the reach of children, livestock, pets. And uh, so they've changed. A lot of them have changed. Lastly, right here, this is one thing. Pick up any strychnine baits that spills on the ground where non-target species can find it. Spills are a huge thing. Do not allow that to happen. Um, you can't even use them as strychnine baits above ground since 1989. We're not endorsing any of these products. We're just using them as examples today. And then groundwater, lastly, um, where a lot of these are being applied underground, Make sure that you don't have a chance of leaching into the soil. I've run over my time. <laughs>